The title of today's message is Redeemed Unto God for His Service. Redeemed unto God for His Service. It says in Romans chapter 7, verse 14, But I am carnal, sold under sin. In this chapter, the Apostle Paul refers to his former life before his redemption and salvation through Jesus Christ. At that time, Paul was a carnal man who sought to live by the law. But because he was carnal, he was unable to do so. As he wrote, he was sold under sin. Paul describes this bondage in his life. He thought to do good, but could not. And the bad he sought to avoid, that is exactly what he did. You see, Paul was bound. He was a slave to sin and its works, even though he didn't like it. He could not help himself. However, his life changed forever when he met Jesus on the road to Damascus. Romans chapter 8, verse 2. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. Through the divine blood of Jesus Christ, Paul was redeemed, set free from all the bondages of the devil and sin. He was now a child of God. And he writes in Romans chapter 8, verses 16 and 17, The Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ, equal heirs with the only begotten. If, now here's the key. This is where the, the whole message rests upon. If so be that we suffer with him, that we may be also glorified together. After his conversion, Paul became a wonderful vessel for the Lord. By the Holy Spirit, God would pour his greatness into Paul, and he in turn would serve it to humanity. Paul was not only a child of God, but his servant also. Serving the fruits of holiness unto all people he came in contact with. Romans chapter 6, verse 22. But now, being made free from sin and become servants to God, ye have your fruit unto holiness and the end everlasting life. Paul understood by the Holy Ghost the significance of what took place in his life when Jesus revealed himself to him on the road to Damascus. That Paul was born in sin and living a life of bondage to sin. And that his liberty and freedom was purchased by Jesus using his divine blood that he sacrificed on Calvary. By the power of divine blood, Paul was adopted into the family of God and given a brand new life. However, it doesn't stop there. Paul understood with this new life, he no longer belonged to himself. Only to Jesus, the one who gave himself for Paul's redemption and his eternal life. And Paul writes in Galatians chapter 2, verse 20, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Paul not only lived his life as a servant unto the Lord, he instructed every child of God who has been redeemed to do the same. Listen closely, 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 22 and 23. For he that is called in the Lord, being a servant, is the Lord's freeman. Likewise also, he that is called, being free, is Christ's servant. Here it is. Through the blood you're free, but yet you're a servant unto the Lord. Ye are bought with a price. Be not ye the servants of men. Child of God, like Paul, your liberty and freedom were purchased by Jesus 
and His divine blood. Now, being free, the call of God is upon your life, just as the Scripture says. You are to freely submit yourself to become a servant unto Christ, willingly presenting yourself a living sacrifice unto the Lord. Romans chapter 12, verse 1. Paul exhorts the church, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, I plead with you, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies, your bodies, the temple you live in here on this earth, a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. In God's eyes, it's a reasonable service. After the price that he paid for you, it's reasonable in God's eyes that you present this body you live in now, the new life that you have, as a living sacrifice, a living sacrifice unto the Lord. But notice, Paul does not command them. He pleads with them, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, meaning you're of free will. When you get saved, when you're purchased through the blood of Jesus, when you receive a new life, you still have free choice to answer the call to become a servant of God or not. And this is where many Christians mess it up. They become children of God. They rejoice and glorify in all that God has done for them. But somehow they lack in feeling that responsibility. Somehow that call to become a servant is dull in their ear. And they continue on after redemption, going their own way and doing their own thing without any responsibility unto the Lord for all that he's done for them. Giving Jesus the only begotten as a sacrifice. And in this sermon, I ask you, how do you view yourself and your life on earth, O child of God? What is your purpose in this life? What is your mission? What is your responsibility? Who has leadership and ownership of your life? Day by day. In the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve were made in liberty, freedom, and perfection. They enjoyed wonderful fellowship with divinity. All needs and beyond were supplied for them. However, everything changed when they sinned against God. By their sin, the human race was sold into this bondage of Satan and sin. The curse of sin and death would now reign over the human race. The in captivity, humanity was powerless to free themselves. Even if they wanted to be free, they couldn't do it within themselves. And this is why God had to send Jesus to earth. Luke chapter 19, verse 10, Jesus said, For the Son of Man is come to seek and to save that which was lost. Jesus came to this earth with divine blood to purchase all that was lost when the human race sinned against God. To gain a better understanding of what I speak of, I take you to the Old Testament. In Leviticus chapter 25, here is a clear picture under the law of Moses of what Jesus did for the human race. Now, under the law, God, there were certain laws, certain ceremonies, certain practices under the law of Moses that gave pictures of what was to come under Jesus, the New Testament, under grace. And God did this on purpose, painting these pictures under the law so people could see it when it was revealed to them in living reality, when Jesus came to earth. Now, in this chapter, we learn of the law of redemption. When a person would lose a piece of land in debt, or a family member was taken for a slave because of debt, that person or a close relative, they would be given the opportunity to redeem the land or the family member that was enslaved. However, anyone thinking to make the purchase, they had to meet three requirements. 
The person had to be closely related. The person must be willing to make the purchase. They could not be forced to. And number three, the person must have the money or the price of redemption. Now, if someone met all three qualifications, the law identified them as a redeemer kinsman. Now, when Jesus came to earth, his divine mission was to be the redeemer kinsman for all that was lost and put in bondage when Adam and Eve sinned. Therefore, Jesus had to meet all three requirements. Well, number one, he became the Son of Man. In other words, he became related to the human race. Number two, he came to earth of his own free will. The heaven, his heavenly Father did not force him to do it. He volunteered. And number three, he came with the purchase price in his body, divine blood. By dying on the cross, Jesus fulfilled his divine mission, becoming the Redeemer kinsman to anyone who would believe upon him. When a person is born again, they have been redeemed unto God, not with money, but through the power of divine blood. Isaiah 52, 3, For thus saith the Lord, Ye have sold yourselves for naught, and ye shall be redeemed without money. The Lord speaking to the time when redemption would come, not by way of money, but through divine blood. 1 John chapter 1, verse 7, But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanseth us from all sin. Now, at this point, it is important to note, only Jesus could have paid such a ransom to be the redeemer kinsman of the human race and the earth. And this is witnessed by John the Revelator in the book of Revelation, some of the most blessed scripture in the word of God. He's caught up to heaven in a vision, and he's standing before the throne of God to witness a great event. Revelation chapter 5, verses 6 and verses 9. And I beheld, and lo, in the midst of the throne, and of the four beasts, and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb as it had been slain having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent forth into all the earth. Verse 9, And they sung a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof. For thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation. For God so loved the world, he gave Jesus the pearl of great price, the bright and morning star. The greatest, most valuable treasure heaven could afford was used to pay the debt for the human race, to purchase every person, soul, mind, and body who would believe upon him. John 3, 16, for God so loved the world, that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth upon him should not perish, but have everlasting life. When you receive deliverance and salvation through the divine blood of Jesus, you are set free from the bondages of sin and are now become a servant to God and to his righteousness. Romans 6:18. Being then made free from sin, ye became the servants of righteousness. As your Lord and Heavenly Father, God takes full responsibility to protect you, care for you, and supply all your needs according to His riches and glory through His Son, Christ Jesus. Purchased with divine blood, you are responsible to serve the Lord obey his word, and his will for your life. That the fruit of your life 
may be unto the glory of God. Jesus spoke in Matthew chapter 5, verses 14 and 16. Ye are the light of the world. A city that is set on an hill cannot be hid. Let your light so shine before men, that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. And Paul speaks of the same. In 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 19 and 20, What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own? For ye are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. The Word says, if you declare yourself to be a child of God, you are not your own. God owns you. You have a responsibility daily before Him. Whether you realize it or not, whether you choose to accept that responsibility or not. But I assure you, the day will come sooner or later where you will have to face that responsibility. Whether you want to or not, you will have to face God and that responsibility before Him. Now, it is important to note Jesus came to earth not only to die for our sins and purchase our redemption through His divine blood as the Son of Man. He came to show us how to live. He came to show us, demonstrating the life of a true child of God. Now, in the book of Philippians, we see a clear picture of Jesus' life on earth in just a few verses, as only the Holy Spirit could portray it. This is our example. This is what we follow. He being the Son of Man, yet the Son of God. We being Son of Men, yet children of God. Philippians chapter 2, verse 5, Paul writes, Let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus. Okay, what is this mind that he speaks of? As the Son of Man, Jesus took on a certain mindset. He understood His responsibility before His heavenly Father in this life on earth. He was the Son of God who came to earth to serve humanity God's greatness. Verse 6 in Philippians 2, "...who, being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God." Jesus as the Son of Man did not think it robbery or an injustice to be equal with God. In fact, He declared Himself to be one with His heavenly Father in the 14th chapter of John's Gospel. Then, later on in the 15th chapter of John's Gospel, Jesus said His followers are to abide in Him, and His Word is to abide in them, thus making us one with Him. Verses 7 and 8. In Philippians 2, but made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself, and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Jesus did not come to this earth as the Son of God, King of kings and Lord of lords. He did not come to be served. He did not come to be exalted and lifted up before men. Jesus came as the Son of Man. He humbled Himself. He took on the form of a servant without reputation. He was a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. He was despised and rejected of men. In fact, Jesus Himself proclaims, He did not even have a place of His own to lay His head. Jesus, the Son of God, came to earth to serve. To serve His heavenly Father and obey His will even unto death. To serve the human race, everything heaven made available to humanity. Deliverance, freedom for soul, mind, and body. Luke chapter 4, verse 18. 
The, Jesus said, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he hath anointed me to serve. He hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised. Child of God, as Paul wrote in Philippians, is this the mind in you? Do you have the mind to serve? Shortly before Jesus fulfilled his mission on earth, he was preparing his followers to take his place. And before he would leave earth, he was doing this not only by teaching, but in demonstration. And I take you to John chapter 13, verses 12 through 16. So after he had washed their feet and had taken his garments and was set down again, he said unto them, Know ye what I have done to you? Ye call me Master and Lord, and ye say, Well, for so I am. If I then your Lord and Master have washed your feet, ye also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example, that ye should do as I have done to you. Verily, verily, I say unto you, the servant is not greater than his Lord, neither he that is sent greater than he that sent him. Here Jesus is instructing his followers, I am your Lord and Master. Being my servants, you are not greater than me. What I have done as an example to you, do also to one another. I have demonstrated to you servitude and humility. As my followers, you are to serve. That which you receive of me, you serve to others. Who is your Lord in your daily life? Who do you serve? And I don't mean with tongue and in word, who do you serve in action and in deed? Day by day, who do you bow to? Jesus said in Matthew 6, 24, No man can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. And I'll go beyond that and declare, you cannot serve God and family, you cannot serve God in the cares of this life. You cannot serve God in self. You can't do it. Oh, you'll try. You may think you're doing and getting by, but not in God's eyes. And again, sooner or later, the truth will be made known. And I pray, Lord willing, sooner rather than later. Now I take you to the 17th chapter of Luke's Gospel. Here, Jesus speaks about a person's expected service unto God. And take note of this passage of Scripture. Study this carefully this week. This is Jesus speaking to children of God, to servants of God, and what God expects. This is what God expects. This is the word. This is the meat of the word. You need to study it and digest it thoroughly to get a clear picture with the help of the Holy Spirit as to your responsibility unto the Lord. Luke chapter 17, verses 7 through 10. Jesus speaking. But which of you, having a servant, plowing or feeding cattle, will say unto him, By and by, when he has come from the field, go and sit down to me. And will not rather say unto him, Make ready wherewith I may sup, and gird thyself and serve me, till I have eaten and drunken. And afterwards thou shalt eat and drink. Doth he thank that servant, because he did the things that were commanded him? I trow not. Or in other words, I believe not. Here it is. 
so likewise ye, when ye shall have done all those things which are commanded of you, say, we are unprofitable servants. We have done that which was our duty to do. Now, there are certain lessons we can learn from what Jesus said in this scripture reading. Number one, we are servants unto the Lord. We put his will before our personal well-being. Number two, our service unto the Lord is an expected duty. Number three, never believe that the more you give of yourself unto the Lord and his service, that it means God is somehow obligated to you in a greater way. You are simply fulfilling your duty before God. Even if it's unto death, you're simply fulfilling an expected duty after what he's done for you. Number four, neither should anyone be lifted up or exalted in their own eyes for their service unto the Lord. No matter what you do, no matter the work, no matter how God uses you, no matter how many souls you help win, no matter how long you serve him, never be lifted up. You're just a servant in this body of flesh, in this life on earth. All that we are called to do and everything we give of ourselves is to be done only in love, gratitude, and humility as a reasonable service unto God. God gave Jesus for our ransom. That is a price we can never repay. We can never repay. Even if we give our life's blood, we could never repay that ransom. We could serve the Lord many lifetimes over on this earth and never be able to repay him for our redemption because it was only Jesus who could redeem us. Jesus died that we may live forever. God gave you eternal life through the death of Jesus. How do you repay that? How do you repay that? You can't. You cannot. Even if you give your life's blood, your life's blood is not giving God eternal life, but Jesus' life's blood gave you eternal life. So, child of God, never think that God requires too much of you. Never complain that the sacrifice is too much for the one who sacrificed all for you. Again, these things must, be go, must go beyond mental assent, tongue, and word, and must be applied in deed and in truth. We must remember our love, duty, responsibility, and obligation before the Lord. Keep the mindset of Jesus and remember the kind of life he lived on earth as a demonstration to you. Meditate on what he taught in Luke 17, 10, that we are unprofitable servants. For all that we do unto the Lord is our duty. It's just an expected duty. Never think more highly of yourself than you should. At this moment, I take you back to Philippians chapter 2, because it doesn't end here. This is the beautiful part of it that goes beyond. Now, taking you back to chapter 2, where it describes Jesus, his humble life of servitude on earth, his example unto us. Jesus served his Father's will. Jesus served people God's greatness. He endured much. He suffered much. Now, consider Jesus' eternal reward in heaven for his humble life of serving on earth. Philippians chapter 2, beginning in verse 9. Wherefore, God also hath highly exalted him, and given him a name which is above every name, 
that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. The Apostle Paul writes in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 12, that if we suffer for Jesus' sake, following in his footsteps, we shall reign with him. Now I want to take you back briefly to Revelation chapter 5. It all ties together. Here, where the multitudes of redeemed are before the throne of God, they are giving praise to the Lamb of God for his redemption of their lives, for his sacrifice. But yet take note of what they say in Revelation chapter 5, verse 10. Speaking unto Jesus, and hast made us unto our God kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. Child of God, by Jesus' sacrifice, you have been redeemed unto God made his heir and a joint heir with Jesus. As you follow in Jesus' footsteps in this life, as required and expected by God, freely giving yourself unto the service of the Lord, like Jesus, you will be rewarded in the next life. And Jesus speaks to this in Luke chapter 19. Here a nobleman goes on a journey. Before leaving, he gives talents to each of his servants, and he commissions his servants to work for him while he is away by trading and increasing the talents given them. Upon his return, the nobleman rewards the faithful servants who worked and increased the talents for their Lord. Luke 19, 17, And he said unto him, Well, thou good servant, because thou hast been faithful in a very little, have thou authority over ten cities. As Jesus, the Son of God, remained faithful on earth to obey his heavenly Father in all things and serve humanity, the greatness of God, in eternity, his heavenly Father has highly exalted his name, making him King of kings and Lord of lords. So too, if we remain faithful to obey our Lord in all things and serve humanity, the greatness of God, by the Holy Spirit in all love and humility, we will be exalted in the next life, made kings and priests under Christ during the perfect age of 1,000 years. Friend, listening to this sermon today, have you been redeemed through the blood of Jesus? Are you free from all the bondages of the devil and his works? Are you free from that bondage of sin? Or are you like Paul, still carnal, sold under sin, seeking to do right, but you can't do it, knowing the right you should do, but you're unable to do that? That's bondage. But there's power in the redeeming blood of Jesus to set you free from that bondage, to set you free from the authority of sin. Pray this prayer with me. Believe it in your heart and let the blood power of Jesus' divine blood that was spilled at Calvary set you free and give you the born again experience. Say, O oh God, I confess all of my sin before you. Forgive me, Father, and I will serve you the rest of my life. And I believe there is power in the divine blood of Jesus, power that washes away all of my sin. Say, come into my heart, Jesus. Come into my heart, Jesus. And amen. And if you meant that prayer, Jesus is yours. Yield yourself to him, serve him. And a greater day comes in the next life where we, as he already is, will be exalted. If you need healing in your body, 
God gave Jesus for that. It tells us in the Word, He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon Him, and with His stripes we are healed. Receive healing today. Jesus said his believers would lay hands on the sick and they would recover. Friend, I'm the Lord's believer. Put your hand against mine on the screen as a form of laying on of hands. You listening by radio, put your hand on your listening device. Lord, in the name of Jesus, I bring this people before you now. God, lay a healing hand upon each one. In the holy blood name of Jesus, heal, heal, heal. Let that virtue flow to each one to make them well. The price has been paid. Lord, move for your honor and glory. In the name of Jesus, and amen. Friend, watch every improvement. Give God the honor and glory, and let us know what God has done for you. And if you don't have the Holy Ghost, I want to encourage you to receive him. To be the servant that Jesus was, takes the Holy Ghost. As the Son of Man, Jesus received the Holy Ghost, and what a servant he became. We too must have the Holy Ghost to serve in a way that pleases our Heavenly Father. Lord, in the name of Jesus, I call the anointing down upon the people to receive the Holy Ghost. Receive ye the Holy Ghost in the name of Jesus. Receive ye the Holy Ghost in the blood name of Jesus. And amen. God bless you today.